this session, we have three eminent speakers. Uh, let me just briefly introduce them uh, one by one. Dr. Ben Carlson um, has been working with Gamma Knife Technology since 1986 on more than 4,000 patients, extensive experience there. Uh, he was former director of centers at Karolinska uh, in Sweden and Goethe Institute in Germany. And he has been also involved with the development of technology in Singapore and has helped to train local doctors to become proficient with the system. Uh, the other second speaker is Dr. Bala, a senior consultant radiation oncologist with ANSYS with a keen interest in neuro-oncology, did his fellowship in Sydney and subsequently got his Master of Clinical Investigation uh, with research interest in radio surgery, uh, in uh, interaction of um, radio surgery, uh, radiation, immune system, and vasculature, and has published extensively in these areas. And the third speaker is Dr. Rachel Wong, Associate Consultant with ANSYS, uh, with a keen interest also in uh, medical oncology in um, neurological metastasis and is published extensively also in these areas. So let's welcome our three speakers. Thank you. Well. Well, I'm honored to be speaking here today, and I'm going to speak a little about uh, radio surgery for brain metastasis. More of the limitations than opportunities. And to start, I want to give, how do I forward the slides? To start, I want to give you a background of the number of lesions that uh, we start with. Why is that an issue? And I think one reason is historical, because radio surgery was developed by neurosurgeons. And as a neurosurgeon in the 80s, you treat the patient with the single metastasis. Multiple lesions was not the patient for us. And another reason was, of course, that the assumption is that if you see 10 lesions, there are another 10 that you don't see. And this patient does not benefit from local treatment. And then the third factor is the toxicity, because in those days we get very high doses that limit the number of lesions that we could treat. And also practical reason, because there's a limited time available, and the more lesions you treat, the longer the treatment time. I started to use gamma knife in the mid 80s, and this was one of the patients that was treated before I started. A patient with a metastasis from malignant melanoma. Two years later, the lesion was still there, but the patient was in good condition. At that time, the dogma was that you cannot treat a malignant lesion with a single session radiation because you always have cells that are in a radio resistant phase. But we thought that if you could cover the lesion or have the patient controlled for two years, that more than enough from the majority of patients. But again, you have the problem with the high doses. You can see here, this patient was treated 100 gray, which was a belief at that time. So when we started to decide to treat with brain meds, of course, <clears throat> the number became an issue. No longer an issue to have a limitation of one. So what was the number we would choose? And this paper was published from a big group in the US, <clears throat> and they found that up to 90% of the patients have up to four brain metastases. So we said four is a good limit. And that limit persisted for many years in many countries for maybe this is one of the reasons. The first doctor that challenged this concept was Isaac Wolf in Florida. He treated patients with 10 plus metastases <clears throat> and he reported this in a gamma knife meeting in the early 2000s. We all thought it was crazy, to be honest. 10 plus lesions for radio surgery, that's madness. But one of the slides he showed that still stuck in your mind it was a picture from the New York Marathon, and one of the patients had on this t-shirt, 
ask me about my 10 brain metastases. So clearly this patient was doing well. But to say the least, this was controversial. Even so controversial, it ended up in the Wall Street Journal. Because at that time, gamma knife <clears throat> was deemed to be a very exclusive treatment for a very limited number of patients. And of course, if you start to treat brain metastases, the number of suitable patients increased drastically. So as you can see, Dave Larson said that a patient with nine metastases is not a good case for radiosurgery. I say the first major publication that showed that it actually is feasible is the study we did from the Karolinska. As you can see on this slide, this is two to five year survival. Yellow line <clears throat> represents a single lesion and they live longer. But all others are multiple lesions, two to five, no, one to two to three, three to four, five to eight, and more than eight. And there's no difference in survival. So this study implied that <coughs> multiple lesions, there's no relation with the number of lesions and, <coughs> sorry, and the survival time. And this was confirmed by a later Japanese study. They found exactly the same. Single lesions do better, two to four or five to 10, no difference on survival. So as you all know, where is the limit? Why 10? Because 10 has been standard now, I say, for many radiotherapy center. So what if you have a patient with eight leads in the diagnostic scan, you do the stereotactic high resolution scan, you find another 20. Well, we decided to treat them and we named them Club 20, patients with 20 or more brain metastases. And to date, we treated 61 lesions, most female, young, with lung cancer, 20 to 30 lesions. Total tumor volume is not that big, less than 7 cc. 12 gray volume, which relates to the risk of side effect, is not that large. The patients that die do do so because of the extracranial disease, and actually we followed all patients but two for the, uh, until death or three months from now. What we're afraid of, of course, in treating so many lesions is the short-term side effect. And this is the only case that I'm aware of. I treat a patient, and one month later, the patient had headache, nausea, and dysphagia, and uh, saw me in the clinic. We gave steroids. The patient deteriorated, came to A&E a few days later with this massive edema. The patient was given steroid, and my understanding is that the patient recovered from the steroid treatment. This is the overall survival time. You can see. Six months survival, two out of three. One year, one out of two. Two years, one out of four. And three years, one out of 10. How does that relate to the Japanese study? The Japanese study to the right here has extrapolated to our data, the red line here. And you can see the survival is virtually exactly the same. So again, it's a strong evidence that the number of lesions has really no in the <coughs> value by itself. Most important factors is ECOG factor. If the patient doing well clinically, they have a better survival chance as compared to not doing so well. It's very basic and very obvious. Sex makes a difference. Female patients, as usual, do better than males. Tumor volume doesn't reach significance. You can see here, larger tumors have the trend to live a little bit shorter, but the number of lesions has no impact whatsoever. Actually, as of now, the patient with 30 plus metastases live in average longer than the one 20 to 30. No impact on outcome when it comes to survival is age, primary tumor, number of lesions, and again, extra versus intracranial death. That means it's not so that the patient that die quickly after the gamma knife do so because of the brain problem, but they do so because of the extracranial problem. Distant tumor control. Of course, we cannot accept to sterilize the brain with a single session of treatment. There may be invisible micrometastases, there may be new seeding, there may be other factors. So to the left here, you can see the likelihood for the patient to develop additional lesions in the brain. And as you can see here to the far left, half of the patient have developed a new lesion within uh, six months. But on the right, you can see the number of patients that deemed to be benefit from an additional radiation treatment being second gamma knife or whole brain. And that's half of the half. So a quarter of the patient was deemed to benefit from a second radiation treatment. If you split that up to the right here, whole brain versus gamma knife, you can see that the first six months, actually only 10% of the patient did receive whole brain. 
That implies that it's not so if a patient has 25 visible leaves and the patient has 250 unvisible that would show up in a few months. That doesn't seem to be the case. And I think is that the far majority of the patients treated with the whole brain did so because of leptomindial disease, which is basically an extracerebral but intracranial disorder. So in conclusion, the number of brain metastases is irrelevant. The idea of brain metastases, the micrometastases may be true, but it doesn't seem to be a clinical relevance. And of course, the poorer the patient do at the treatment, the poorer the prognosis is. And the total volume shouldn't be too large. A quarter of the patients had intracranial tumor control since the first gamma knife. And of course, that is not because there was no micro disease or no lesions, but because the systemic treatment is so efficient today. My second portion is about how large is too large. And clearly, you cannot treat too large patients, too large metastasis with single session radiation. I just showed you the example to the left here. And to the right, you see a patient with extensive edema. This is actually an epilepsy case. But this is the kind of radiation com complications you are scared of. So Japanese group thought, why don't we split the treatment into two sessions with a month apart? And the preliminary experience was actually quite good. So Prof. Yu saw the presentation and say, why don't we start here? And I said, nah. But he said, yes, let's do it. So we did it. And uh, what we managed to do was that we had Parkway to void the costs for the second treatment for subsidized patients. So the patient pay for one treatment and get two sessions. So far, only six patients. One of them did not do the second treatment. The other five did, and all of them are at present alive. I'll just show, shortly show you these cases. This is one of the first cases, a post lesion. You see to the left is the first treatment, to the right is the second treatment, and you can see a significant decrease in volume. Then you see the follow-ups, the tumor virtually disappears. Then it resurfaces about a year, and it seems to be a radiation-induced complication because it's been stable the last six months. Second case, again, a posterior fossil lesion, and this lesion disappeared totally. This is the only case that we did not treat the second time. The patient passed away one month and a half after the first treatment, and you can see there was really no response on the first treatment. The next case, slowly but surely decrease of the tumor size, and this is the biggest tumor treated. We gave only 10 gray. In spite of that low dose, half of the, of the tumor disappeared, and the patient, you can see, the tumors continue to decrease. And this case, haven't given the second treatment yet. So why wait one month? Well, there's nothing magic with this, but if you do wait longer time, as in this case, the tumor may resurface, which is an argument to treat a second time. Some result, all but one are responded well. One patient died before the second treatment. The volume decrease in one month is an average 50%, which is quite impressive. So it does seem that this is a feasible method for big metastasis, but the number of cases are few, and uh, it seems, again, that you can avoid surgery for some of these patients. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thanks, Prof. Lo, for the introduction. Uh, thanks for the invitation. And I want to congratulate Prof. Jimmy and the ISOS team for organizing this symposium. Um, what I'll be covering today is radiotherapy for brain metastasis. And in particular, I'll be focusing on the toxicities associated with whole brain radiotherapy and the strategies that we have that we can widen the therapeutic window. So um, I know the audience here is very varied. We deal with different cancers. But this is a topic that we all need to know about because brain metastasis does affect one in 10, cancer, uh, one in 10 patients in their cancer journey, particularly so for patients with lung cancer, breast cancer, and malignant melanoma, but also patients with renal cell carcinoma and colorectal, um, colorectal cancers. And clearly, the, the defining features of brain metastasis is that it is contrast-enhancing, it is quite well-defined, and it typically happens in the gray-white junction, and it does cause some perilesional edema. And as you can see from this photograph, typically most of them present with multiple metastatic deposits. 
Um, as with all other conditions, we adopt a multimodal approach to the management of brain metastasis, uh, be it surgical, radiotherapy, or systemic therapy. But particularly in brain metastasis, surgery and radiotherapy plays a much bigger role. Uh, this is so because there, there is something called a blood-brain barrier. So there are tight endothelial junctions formed by the endothelial cells and the pericytes, which restricts the movement of molecules more than 500 deltons into the brain parenchyma. One of the key concepts that we have in radiation oncology is that of dose volume interplay. So if we are treating a larger volume, we need to reduce the radiation dose that we can give. Uh, if you're treating a small volume, we can escalate the dose as we see in radio surgery. Uh, and to put things in context, uh, when we do radio surgery for a small lesion, we can actually use quite high doses of up to 50 gray on a similar scale. Whereas if you're doing something um, like whole brain radiotherapy, we have to lower the dose to something like 24 gray. And therefore, the effectiveness of the treatments also vary. Another dictum that most radiation oncologists follow is that of a dose response, which is seen both in tumors as well as normal tissue. And often it's a balancing act that we have to undertake to balance tumor control and toxicity. So we want to be somewhere on the green curve where we want to achieve a complication-free control. Coming to the origins of whole brain radiation, this is not new. It's been around for more than 70 years. This is the first paper from back in 1954, which described whole brain radiotherapy primarily in patients with lung cancer. And what they reported was a quite a good response rate of 40 to 60%. And uh, within our fraternity, it's known as donning the German helmet because uh, essentially what we do is we try to block off everything inferior to the orange line to shield that area. Everything superior to that is treated to a uniform dose with usually two lateral beams. And the typical schedule is something like 30 gray in 10 fractions over two weeks. Historically, uh, this is from oncology textbooks in the past. Uh, we know that patients with brain metastasis who are just observed with no further treatment, they have a very dismal survival of usually less than two months. And often this prompted oncologists to adopt a very fatalistic approach to them. Um, adding steroids to the mix does improve uh, survival ever so slightly uh, and also improve symptoms, but long-term steroid uh, usage does come with its toxicities. If we added whole brain radiotherapy to this, uh, survival is improved slightly, but still not quite good enough. We were able to wean off steroids and patients did have good symptom relief. How many radiation oncologists rationalize whole brain radiotherapy is that, as we saw in the previous talk as well, majority of the patients do have multiple metastatic deposits. Although we may just see one on the MRI scan, there are micromets that are seen throughout the rest of the brain in majority of the patients, which may only surface with time. And also because of the blood-brain barrier, this is a chemo sanctuary site, and generally with conventional chemotherapy, the response rates are known to be less than 5%. Um, coming to how easy it is to give uh, whole brain radiotherapy is one of the easiest treatments to deliver. It's cheap, it's not res resource intense, and even in low-income, re low low-resource countries, this can be easily given to majority of the patients. Um, as radiation oncologists, many of us want to do it once and do it well. So we think that if we treat the patient once, that may reduce the need for multiple salvage treatments for patients who may surface up with more metastatic deposits down the road. And uh, there have been multiple studies, but essentially most of them suggest that if we add whole brain radiotherapy to radio surgery, it does improve the local control, it does improve the distant brain control, and therefore the overall brain control and intracranial control is improved in patients when we add whole brain radiotherapy to radio surgery. Um, to, to just give you a figure, so the risk of distant metastasis uh, in the brain with radio surgery alone is expected to be about 70%. If radio, whole brain radiotherapy is added, that is usually about halved. But at the same time, we know that because we're using an overall low dose with whole brain radiation, patients with limited metastatic deposits, giving whole brain alone is usually not quite enough for them to get good local control. They usually recur after some time. And therefore, this phase three study actually showed that adding radio surgery to whole brain improved the local control in patients with lim limited metastatic de deposits in the brain. But the key thing is about patient selection. How do we know which patient was going to live long enough to require prolonged local control? Uh, clearly, a patient with uh, expected survival of less than three months, you know, uh, uncontrolled extracranial disease, may not require very intense treatment for the brain. 
previously we used uh, this RPA system, which was not very granular. It just looked at a few factors such as the age, the performance status, and the extracranial disease. But it did not quite go down into the specifics of the cancer itself. And based on this, there were three classes that we came up with. And clearly, patients in class one perhaps warranted a more aggressive approach for intracranial deposits. Thankfully, with more um, knowledge with the molecular status of tumours and also going down to a tumour-specific grading system, we now have the disease-specific GPA, which further subclassifies these patients. And basically, it tells us that some patients with a very good GPA score may live up to three to four years, and therefore, a more aggressive approach to brain metastasis is warranted. But, you know, clearly, uh, this is... Whole brain radiotherapy is like a taboo word to many oncologists and surgeons. But, um, you know, I just want to put things in perspective. I, there are toxicities with whole brain radiation, and we'll go through that shortly. So exposing the entire brain to radiotherapy does cause effects such as leukoencephalopathy, vascular changes, decreased cognition. Uh, all of these may impair the quality of life of patients. Potentially, it may be over-treatment for some patients, and therefore, and, and because whole brain radiation can only be delivered once in general, there are also limitations in how we salvage these patients once they recur. Uh, resident and me sort of put together some of the acute and late toxicities for patients undergoing brain radiotherapy, which I will not go through. But very early studies, um, which actually adopted a bird's eye view and did not use very, uh, very granular tools. They used a mini mental state to actually see whether the neurocognition of patients improved um, after whole brain radiation. And their conclusion, to much of our surprise, was that the control of the brain tumor was the most important factor to improve neurocognitive function. But this study was based on the MMSE, and therefore we all are a bit skeptical that this is actually a good representation of a patient's cognitive uh, state. Um, later on, most of the trials and prospective studies use a battery of neurocognitive tests, including the Hopkins verbal learning test, the uh, word association test. And essentially what they showed based on this phase three study is that uh, whole brain radiotherapy compared to radiosurgery, that there is increase in neurocognitive decline, particularly for patients who live more than three months or more than six months, as we see the curve separate there. And I had the privilege of being a guest editor in this journal, which looked at the modern approaches of brain metastasis. And essentially, we put together an article summarizing some of the strategies which we can adopt if a patient were to receive um, whole brain radiotherapy. So one of the strategies that we can use is that of using mimentine, which is basically an NMDA blocker. It is used in patients with Alzheimer's disease. And essentially, patients undergoing whole brain radiotherapy, if they were to take six months of mimentine, there was a relative reduction in the cognitive decline uh, in these patients. Another strategy that we have is the hippocampus, which is a structure in the medial part of the temporal lobe. Um, it is involved with consolidation of short-term memory to long-term memory. And with advanced radiotherapy techniques, uh, such as arc therapy, we can actually selectively reduce the dose to the, to the hippocampus. And whereas we treat the entire parts, the remaining parts of the brain to a uniform dose. And the phase two study was suggestive that compared, compared to historical controls, um, the neurocognitive deficits were actually reduced with hippocampal sparing whole brain radiation. And this went on to a phase three study where they compared conventional whole brain with mementine to hippocampal sparing whole brain with mementine. And there was a significant reduction of, of about 25% in neurocognitive decline comparing the two techniques. And therefore, when we, when we offer whole brain radiotherapy to patients, if they are eligible for hippocampal sparing, we do discuss this with the patients. But to put things in context, this is much, uh, much more resource intense treatment compared to the conventional whole brain treatment. And centers have also adopted, you know, why not? Why stop at one? Why not combine everything? So what they've done is they've done hippocampal avoidance. At the same time, they have boosted, uh, they have increased the dose of the gross tumors seen in the brain together with mementine as well. So this is a, sort of an all-in-one approach to reduce cognitive decline in patients undergoing brain radiation. Coming closer to home, um, we are actually undergo undertaking a prospective study where we use AI and digital medicine, uh, and patients I have are given a tablet post-radiation to play certain games to sort of uh, beef up their brain uh, function. 
And this is done usually about two months post-radiation and basically we test the neurocognitive function using a battery of tests uh, along the way. Uh, so far, the trial, the trial has been promising, but it does require a very motivated patient to actually do this, do this test uh, at home on his tablet. So the old framework, it was quite a, it was a knee-jerk reflex. Once we saw brain mats, we said whole brain RT. But I think the contemporary framework is much more detailed and granular. For patients with limited metastatic disease, we do, um, we do consider more aggressive local treatment, uh, sometimes surgery if there's mass effect or if we need tissue, or in, in the setting of uh, small lesions or moderately sized lesions, we can do single session or multi-session radio surgery. And thankfully now we have targeted therapies to which can actually penetrate the blood-brain barrier, uh, particularly for breast and lung cancers as well as melanomas. Uh, but uh, Dr. Rachel Wong will be going through more of this in the next talk. Um, patients with multiple brain mats who have a very poor prognosis, who are expected to pass away within a few months, perhaps best supportive care is a reasonable option. But patients who may live three to six months, whole brain radiotherapy with its modifications can be considered. So um, I think the paradigm of brain metastasis management has shifted from whole brain treatment to focal therapy, and it continues to evolve as more targeted drugs are being discovered. Um, however, even with the evolution of targeted drugs, I believe there's a role for local therapy, especially for patients with symptomatic brain metastasis. And there is a role for both focal treatments such as radiosurgery, as well as more comprehensive treatments such as whole brain radiotherapy. Um, but I think the key is really, as, as with all studies, about appropriate patient identification, therefore, and also instituting risk mitigation strategies up front. All right, thank you. Sorry, how do I get my slides? Yeah, okay. Um, hi, I'm Rachel from uh, Medical Oncology, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me to share more about the new and evolving um, systemic strategies in brain metastasis. So this will be the content that I'll be covering. Um, so very quickly, we know that metastasis or secondary brain tumors are the most common um, intracranial tumors in adults, accounting for more than 50%. And 20 to 40% uh, 20 to 40 of all of our patients actually uh, will encounter uh, brain metastasis during their course of um, uh, their disease, of which the highest um, incidence actually involves uh, patients uh, with uh, lung, uh, breast, as well as uh, melanoma, which um, Dr. Bala had also mentioned. Um, so some of the therapeutic challenges that we face, uh, we do know that patients with brain metastasis do have a very dismal five-year overall survival uh, of 2.4%. Um, and in patients who have um, brain metastasis, um, most uh, historically treatment has been uh, surgery as well as radiotherapy. Um, but there have been actually advancement in terms of systemic options, which I would like to focus my talk on. I'm um, sorry, actually this uh, was one of my older slides, so um, some of the, the, the slides actually may be a, a little bit additional. Um, but basically this is a, a treatment algorithm that was suggested by the eno ASMO guidelines. And I would like to um, draw your attention basically to the red box, which actually um, shows that actually systemic pharmacotherapy, which has uh, historically actually been, uh, have very dismal um, response rates in the brain, is actually suggested as one of the reasonable options. And we will talk about the reasons why. So, um, sorry. so I would just like to start off firstly with a very uh, specific subgroup of patients with non-small cell lung cancer. So we do know that in terms of our understanding of non-small cell lung cancer, this has changed over the past few decades, whereby we now know that it's not just a simple dichotomy between squamous and non-squamous um, small cell lung cancers, but there are actually a proportion of patients who do have oncogenically driven um, uh, non-small cell lung cancers, whereby we do have uh, systemic targeted therapies with varying degree of uh, intracranial responses. Um, yeah. Sorry, um, this is my old slide, so I'll just move on. So um, firstly, we do have osimetinib, which actually is a third generation um, uh, EGFR targeting TKI, which has been shown to have very good um, intracranial responses of up to 91% in patients with measurable brain metastasis um, in comparison with earlier generation, first, uh, first generation TKIs with a response rate of about 68%. In terms of um, uh, survival, this has also um, translated to an improvement in terms of their overall um, survival. Yeah, sorry. 
In terms of um, elk addicted um, non-small cell lung cancers, we do have various generations of, of elk inhibitors that have been um, developed over the years. And as we can see um, on the later generations, the second generation TKIs, they are actually achieving a response rate, intracranial response rates of up to 80%, which is quite impressive. Um, and the latter one was actually the, a novel third generation um, TKI that has been uh, developed specifically to have improved uh, intracranial uh, responses. Also does have intracranial responses of 82%, uh, of which majority of them are actually complete responses. Um, however, in terms of immunotherapy, which we, might, we may know is actually one of the standard of care in patients with non-oncogenically driven non-small cell lung cancer, uh, the data still remains uh, fairly limited as most of the trials actually had excluded patients with active um, brain metastasis. And as we can see in this table, uh, most, of them, most of the data that we have are actually from retrospective uh, real-world analysis um, with uh, differing intracranial responses of about 20-30%. So moving very quickly on to um, breast cancer. Um, so up to 30% of patients with breast cancer do um, develop brain metastasis, of which um, in particular for HER2 positive as well as triple negative breast cancers, they have a higher incidence of brain metastasis of up to 50%. And really um, focusing on HER2 positive breast cancers, where ha there has been a huge change in terms of our treatment algorithm in the past couple of years. Um, this is where most of the data for the use of systemic therapy is. So traditionally, we do have oral TKIs that have been used in, com in conjunction with chemotherapy with fairly um, uh, good response rates, however, still ranging between 20 to 40 percent. What has really changed um, the, the treatment of patients with HER2 positive breast cancers is actually this um, oral agent to catenip, which is a novel um, uh, HER2 directed TKI that has, uh, that has increased selectivity for the HER2 receptor. And in this trial, um, what, was, what is very different compared to all the other trials that we'll be talking about is that they actually allowed patients with active brain metastasis onto the trial. Um, and patients with active brain metastasis either had brain metastasis that were untreated or were actually progressing at the time of uh, inclusion into the, into the trial. And as we can see, there was actually an improvement in terms of um, overall survival, uh, as well as local control as well, uh, even intracranially with the addition of tucatinib to trastuzumab as well as kipsidabin. Um, we can see that in terms of the intracranial uh, response rates, this had actually more than doubled from 20% um, to 47%. And um, particularly, this is actually in patients with active brain metastasis who, have, who may or may not have had previous um, local treatment. And this had actually translated to an improvement in terms of their um, CNS progression, as well as um, there was a reduction of a risk of death by half. Um, antibody drug conjugates are actually one of the up-and-coming um, systemic agents. And uh, just to give us an idea, basically it allows for um, targeted delivery of our traditional, anti, uh, of our traditional cytotoxic agents uh, by linking them to um, HER2, uh, in this case HER2 targeting um, antibodies to hone in onto the tumor cells. And um, so this is one of the earlier um, uh, antibody drug conjugates, uh, TDM1, which also did have uh, uh, quite a good um, clinical benefit rate in terms of patients with a brain metastasis. But what is uh, really up and coming is this drug, trastuzumab deruxtecan, which is a novel um, ADC that has actually changed um, our second line standard of care currently in the latest Destiny Breast O3 trial. Um, in this trial, there was a subgroup of patients with uh, brain metastasis, um, which actually uh, did show that in patients who were treated with trastuzumab deruxtecan, there was an improvement of uh, uh, intracranial response rates of up to 60-odd percent. And currently, there are ongoing studies of both the DEBRA as well as the Tuxedo-1 trial, which is actually looking at the use of trastuzumab deruxtecan, similar to our previous um, her 2 climb study, where they are actually looking at patients with active brain metastasis. And uh, preliminary results actually do show fairly promising um, response rates as well, and we await further studies. Um, in, okay, in the interest of time, I'll just skip over um, triple negative breast uh, cancers because currently in terms of the systemic agents, um, a lot of the data are still immature and uh, we would still prefer um, using local treatment in the, in the, in the management of these patients. Okay, lastly, in terms of melanoma, um, the treatment landscape also for melanoma has changed over the past decade, where by now the, uh, the standard of care actually involves immunotherapy as well as targeted therapy. And this has really changed the survival of our patients from a previously um, less than 5%, five-year overall survival, to patients living, um, most of our patients living more than five years 
And in terms of the data supporting um, immunotherapy in patients with brain metastasis, we do have two landmark studies, the Checkmate 204 study, which actually looked at patients with um, brain metastasis uh, treated with um, a combination of ipilimumab as well as nivolumab, which are two checkpoint inhibitors. And as we can see, especially in patients who are asymptomatic at baseline, they do have a fairly good intracranial response rates of more than 50%. However, in patients who do have a symptomatic brain met and may be on um, um, steroids, for example, um, in cohort B, um, they do have uh, lower response rates of about 17%. And these um, results were actually mirrored and confirmed in the ABC trial, uh, which was actually a randomized phase 2 trial, which uh, randomized patients to receiving either single agent nivolumab um, in cohort B or um, a combination of ipilimumab and nivolumab as per uh, cohort A. And they also did have um, similar response rates as we see in the Checkmate 204 study. And just to draw your attention specifically um, to to AMC, which was patients who had symptomatic uh, brain metastasis who were either on steroids or leptomeningeal disease um, or had prior um, local treatment, they actually had fairly dismal um, response rates of only 6%. So perhaps these patients may not be suitable um, for systemic uh, treatment alone. Uh, moving on to a group of patients, um, uh, Patients who have a BRF uh, the targeting um, a mutation, uh, which accounts for about 50% of melanoma patients, we do have uh, data as well for the use of targeted therapy in the treatment of patients with brain metastasis. And this comes from um, the COMBI-BM trial, which actually looked at patients um, with brain metastasis. They had four different cohorts. Um, and basically, the idea is that in this uh, group of patients, um, the treatment with the brafenib as well as trametinib, which are oral targeted um, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, they actually did achieve a response rate of 44 to 59%. And these patients actually uh, they actually included patients who had active brain metastasis or patients who were um, on steroids and perhaps in comparison with the use of immunotherapy, um, these targeted agents could be considered in patients with a BRAF mutation. And um, similarly, in terms of um, some of the um, systemic uh, review as well as meta-analysis, which may suggest that um, in patients with uh, a brain metastasis, a combination together with local, um, with local uh, uh, radiotherapy can improve um, local control as well as overall survival. Although we need to take note uh, and keep in mind that there may be higher rates of intracranial hemorrhage as well. So um, basically, I think in terms of the management of these patients, this definitely has to be a multidisciplinary approach whereby we discuss uh, accordingly with our radiotherapists um, whether this may be a, a, a treatment option for our patients. So I think um, just to wrap up in conclusions, we know that uh, patients with brain metastasis there are many different options in terms of treatment and um, this is definitely uh, better managed in a multidisciplinary setting. Uh, while there is uh, many factors that we do take into account and with particular in terms of systemic treatment that may be helpful in a very um, special subgroup of patients. Um, we do need more research uh, to determine the optimal sequencing approach. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ben Carlson, uh, Dr. Bala and Dr. Rachel for your most um, truly excellent lectures. I think in the interest of uh, time, um, and the lunch uh, lecture coming up, uh, we will not have uh, the Q&A, but I'm sure the three speakers uh, will still be around um, if you want to ask them uh, directly your questions. But uh, once again, let us uh, give them a round of applause for their great presentations. Thank you very much. <laughs>